Hi. Hi. My name is Jason, and I am a freak. <laughs> See, normally when I do that, I say, my name is Jason, and I'm a university professor. And then I have to qualify it with a long list of proofs to prove that point. Um, but let me do a little exercise with you first here. Um, what do you call, like, let's say you're working in a store, and a woman walks in, and it's obvious that she's young and she's not married. Um, what would your title be? What would you call her? Miss, right? Okay. What about if a woman came in and you saw a wedding ring on her finger? What would you call her? Mrs. Okay. And what about if that a woman came in and she was older and you became aware that she was uh, a widow or a divorcee? What would you call her? Okay, there'd be a different title. It might be Ms. or Mrs. Okay, now let's do the same experiment with men. A man walks into your store where you're working. What do you call him? Okay, sir, or you would call him Mr., right? An unmarried man. What about if the man has a wedding band, you know he's married, what do you call him? You call him Mr. as well, right? And what about a man who is a widower or a divorcee, what would you call him? Again, the same title, right? Mister. So I, I, this is how I kind of wanted to start my talk today. Um, why is it that we define, label, and title women based upon their sexual availability? Where with men, it doesn't matter. He's always Mister. Um, and why is this process so normalized? We take it as natural. We don't really think about it. Basically, we don't think about it, that's option A. Or option B is we think about it, yet we continue to support it, to perpetuate it. Here we've come to uh, what I want to talk about also today, this key word that my students are probably sick of me talking about all the time. This word is ideology. And I'm going to give you two definitions of ideology. The first by Karl Marx. Ideology is basically defined by Marx as they are doing it, they do not know they are doing it. Basically, this is kind of a false consciousness. It makes us into naive subjects. We believe we are going to university to accumulate more knowledge, but maybe we are really going to university just to become idealized kind of capitalist subjects and capitalist agents. Okay, so there's this sense of uh, we are naive subjects, our view of the world might be distorted, and we believe that we can acquire the knowledge to erase that distortion, even though acquiring the knowledge gives us that distortion. Um, I'll give you another definition, a much more modern definition of ideology by Slavov Zizek. Um, and what he says is they know very well they are doing it, yet they continue to do it anyways. Um, what Zizek calls this, instead of a false consciousness, he calls this a cynical consciousness. Um, in other words, we um, are informed, but kind of non-serious subjects. We behave as though we do not know what we know. So let's speak to a couple of examples concerning ideologies of gender, race, and class, common to Hong Kong and beyond. I'll call this number one, a particular sex sells. It is far from uncommon to see nearly naked women groping one another and almost kissing on billboards in the service of selling, say, chocolates or diamonds or jeans. And yes, I know most of us are aware of, we've seen more, most recently, Justin Bieber uh, wearing his Calvin Klein briefs, and we get to see his torso and his legs, and you know, it's, it's wonderful, <clears throat> definitely wonderful. And we're also aware of, you know, uh, Justin Bieber's Calvin Klein model precursors. We're all aware of David Beckham. And those of us who are a bit older are aware of Marky Mark Wahlberg doing the same thing. However, none of these men seen in their underwear gropes anybody but himself. 
So here's the thought experiment. Wahlberg, Beckham, and Bieber, all but naked together on a poster, <laughs> hugging one another. You know, we, get, we get this sense that they have just kissed, you know, off camera before the picture. And this is just all in the service of selling scissors or vanilla sundaes or snowblowers. See, um, exploiting women as sapphic objects for the purposes of capitalism has been naturalized, it's been normalized. Either we don't know it and we do it, or we're all aware of it and we still support it just because. Yet only when we set up the counterpoint of men doing the same thing is the ideological process of this sexual exploitation made super apparent. Here's another example. Um, I call this one Black is Beautiful. Most of us are aware that uh, in the 60s, in the US, there was a movement formed in order to uh, counteract a sort of almost universalized sense of beauty that had to do with white skin and straight hair. Um, and this uh, exists even, say, in, in the contemporary times in the Philippines. In the Philippines, it's common to say that the most beautiful women come from either Baguio or they come from Dumaguete. Why Baguio and Dumaguete? Baguio, because uh, Baguio is a hill station. It's cold, there's less sun, so the women receive less light, so their skin is lighter. Uh, for the idea of Dumaguete, Dumaguete is understood in the Philippines to be a place that still has a lot of colonial, read white blood. Okay, so again, we have this idea of whiteness as beautiful. Um, in the Hong Kong context, legacies of racism and classicism and colonialism and masculinism have led to what I call an ideology of vampirism. What do I mean by that? Well, it's predominantly women here who walk on the shady side of the street even in the comparatively cold Hong Kong winters of 10 degrees Celsius. You walk on the shady side of the street if you're a woman. It is probably women who use umbrellas, both in the rain and in the sun, and strangely enough, but commonly enough in Hong Kong, in the shade. You know, it, there's this joke. I can, you can imagine a Hong Kong woman who uh, follows this ideology of vampirism, actually standing in the street and standing under a piano falling from 80 stories above just to have a little bit more of a spite from the damaging rays of the sun which darken the skin. And I know that this kind of idea of whiteness as beautiful is also extolled in a lot of uh, Indian and Chinese classical texts. But I, I always ask my students, you know, who wrote these texts? And who supported the legacies of whiteness as beautiful in these texts? These texts were not written by rickshaw wallas in India. These texts were not written by rice farmers throughout China. These texts were not written by the dock workers in Hong Kong. And we also know that these texts probably were not written by women. What I've so far glossed over are some ideological, ideological constraints that limit how we engage with the world or worlds of which we are all part. In other words, I've asked you to think or rethink how you've invested yourselves into your everydays. The title of this series of TEDx HKBU talks is Think Like a Freak, which many of our speakers have addressed today. A title I personally have a problem with, mainly because it appears to be so redundant. Thinking, I cynically think, is itself freakish. To think is to be a freak. Perhaps only freaks think. 
So freaks are thinkers, thus thinkers are freaks. So think and freak are synonymous. Is it freaky to think about how a dark-skinned Indonesian domestic helper might feel when she sees a freakishly white Hong Konger exit the bus with her umbrella already open in order to walk down a shady street to get into a cafe? Is it freaky to wonder about how a black American friend of mine felt when his Korean students gave him whitening cream for a Christmas present? Is it freaky to puzzle over how a collective of Filipino natives picnicking on some sunny beach in Bohol might feel when a busload of tourists alights only freakishly to adorn balaclavas and leggings and sleeves and gloves before gambling in sand and sea? Is it freaky to notice that Pakistani, Indian, and less fair-skinned Hong Kong men never fail to leave their apartments with their ID cards in their pockets while this law doesn't really apply to me? Is it freaky to note? Is it freaky to puzzle, to wonder, to care, to think? I think, I freak, that an edifying and empathetic way to escape the ideologies that determine us, whether they control us passively or cynically, meaning whether, they can, whether these are conscious or unconscious, is to do what Jonathan Franzen asks us to do in his first collection of essays, his fourth book. His fourth book is called How to Be Alone. And what he does is basically present aloneness as a cult reading, as aloneness, and this as a cultural refuse, a way to say no to all of the ideologies that control us, that determine how we think and how we should think. Basically, when we read, we learn how to be alone, and we get to resist. We refuse to accept the ongoing demands of the cultural apparatuses, whether these be familial, political, religious, sexual, racial, social, and every other ideological institution we get to resist when we sit or we stand and wholly immerse ourselves in literature. I mean, how else to sympathize and work to understand and start to feel compassion for a pre-teenager in Germany during the Holocaust? How else to feel compassion for a runaway slave in pre-Civil War or uh, pre-bellum, anti-bellum U.S. How else to empathize or to feel for or to feel compassion for or to recognize the horrors of life in, as an untouchable in early Gandhi, India? How else to connect with a Catholic girl in just post Cromwell, Gaelic remnant Ireland. How else to somehow connect with a crazy, albeit well-meaning, knight errant in Spanish's Siglo de Oro, the Golden Age, the 1600s? All I'm asking is that we think about how particular ideological conditions and institutions position us, and how these same conditions position us to position others. Whether or not we're even aware